Compared with the many Old Testament prophecies about the birth, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus, and those about God's chosen people and land, we're going to discover the prophetic foretelling of the establishment, the purpose, and the prophesied future of the church is relatively sparse. Nevertheless, every sign tells believer and non-believer alike that this world is headed for disastrous conclusion. Now, I know that for many of you, I'll be preaching to the choir by taking a moment to clarify the meaning of the word church, but it's an important point, as we'll see. The Greek word is ekklesia, which means, in the original sense, a gathering of citizens called out from their homes into some public place, an assembly has nothing to do with religion in the original meaning. And that meaning can be for any purpose, for deliberating an agenda. When Jesus was standing with his disciples before the Temple of Pan, also known as the Gate of Hell or Hades, in Caesarea Philippi, he used the word church, as we find in Matthew 16, 18. And I tell you that you are Peter, And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, or hell, will not overcome it. Now here he was referring to Peter as Petros, a small stone or a rock. But then he referred to himself as Petra. It's a large rock, a ledge or a cliff. And Jesus was not establishing Peter as the foundation for a universal church. What he was doing was making it clear that he... Jesus the Christ would be that foundation cornerstone, and the assembly of believers to follow his resurrection would be the church. The apostles were the very first to receive the Holy Spirit promised by Jesus just before his crucifixion. We see this in Acts 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Now Jesus had commanded them to remain in Jerusalem until Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit would be given to all of them. What was that moment like? Well, you can relive that with me in Acts 2. This is verses 1 through 4, which describes it like this. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. That was in the big upper room. And suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Again, he spoke to them in the large room where they were having the Last Supper. And standing there with our small group, when we toured the Holy Land, you can imagine the awe of hearing those words echoing through the centuries in that room. Jesus gave them their commission from that time to speak against sin and to preach about righteous living. The Spirit enabled them to do miracles of speaking in tongues, of healing, and even in several instances to raise the dead. And 50 days later, according to Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost, in a room filled with Jewish men from a number of different lands and languages, the disciples began speaking in tongues. And yet each man heard the same message in his own native tongue. What an incredible, miraculous experience. And as a result, 3,000 became believers. Now make no mistake. It was not the Gentiles that first came to believe into salvation. Look what Paul said in Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Of course, the early Jews assumed that this salvation applied only to them as God's chosen people, until Peter in Acts 10 received the vision of unclean animals that were lowered in a sheep with the command from God to kill and eat of them. And the message was that man was not to call anything impure that God has made clean. 
And then it was a short time later that Peter received an unexpected visitor sent from a Roman centurion who also had a vision. Cornelius was a Gentile, he was a Roman and a soldier who had shown great kindness and charity to those in need. And he had prayed to God regularly. Now the Bible doesn't indicate where this Roman and his family had learned about the true God of creation. Historically, Cornelius and his family and friends made up the very first non-Jewish assembly to be grafted into God's family. Now, I want you to consider this. Had Peter not been the first to lead Gentiles to salvation, then the newcomer Paul would probably have met greater resistance from the other apostles. But we know from the scriptures that Paul was then sent to preach the word to the Gentiles, planting churches throughout Palestine, Syria, Macedonia, Asia, Galatia, and even Italy. And so was born the grafted-in church to which we are all honored to have been called. So how does God then consider us in light of his chosen people, Israel? Well, look at Ephesians 2. This is verses 19 through 22, which says this. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. What an amazing four scriptures. Verse 19 confirms not only that we are not outsiders, but we're fellow citizens with the chosen and we are members. I want you to say Let that sink in, members of God's household. And then in verse 20, it says that we're built on the foundation of all the apostles, all the prophets, but Christ Jesus is the chief cornerstone. So what is the significance of a cornerstone? Well, stonemasons carefully chose that stone and even more carefully formed its lines and its angles for the entire building is aligned on that one foundation block. And it has to be perfect, even as Jesus is perfect. One of the great proofs that the church did not exist before the death of Christ comes from the prophecy way back in Psalms 118. This is verse 22. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Ephesians 2.21 declares that it is he alone that joins us together into a holy temple to the Lord. And again... One could just imagine Paul gazing around at that crowd in Ephesus as he magnifies verse 19, and he says this in verse 22, And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. So in spite of that plain language, there are those even today that say the church has replaced Israel in God's plan. They call that the replacement theology. And tragically, many so-called mainstream denominations are adopting this blasphemy, which will bring a curse down on their heads. I was shocked and I was dismayed at the list of 13 out of 25 major denominations that now believe and teach that lie. May God protect the ministers in those denominations that still preach the true gospel. So there's a question. How does one know that he or she is truly of the church? By attendance at services? You know, we're commanded to assemble together with other believers, but that's not the whole answer. It's been said that standing in a garage doesn't make one a car any more than sitting in a pew makes one a Christian. Well then, how about giving generously of time and money? Christians are already admonished to support the work of God, to visit the widows and the orphans and those in prison, all acts of charity and faithfulness. But remember way back the story of the widow giving two mites, the smallest of Roman coins, 
compared to religious leaders who made a great show of loudly pouring coins into the temple box. The widow gave everything that she had out of love, while the scribes and the Pharisees gave to call attention to their wealth and their position and their power. And Jesus pointed out that God wants the attitude of giving to be from the heart, not the wallet. The amount makes little difference because it is the character of the giver that he lives. Well, then you might ask, how about being constant in prayer? Well, Christ plainly says that public prayers made expressly to be seen by others is hypocritical. And prayers that are repeated vainly, meaning carelessly, uselessly, or, or thoughtlessly, are heathen. And he wasn't speaking of public or corporate prayer as observed in the church. Public prayer is a necessary part of opening and closing religious services. Now what Jesus denounces is making a show of praying to enhance one's reputation as a religious or a righteous person, as well as repetitious, canned prayers and overlong, tedious prayers. Most of the time, the true Christian uses Jesus' example to find a quiet, private place to speak to God. You see, we don't need a priest to advocate for us. When we've actually been permitted to enter past the veil that covered the holy place and to worship and praise and even petition God. Now you try getting an appointment to speak face to face with any world leader. So now let's cut to the chase by describing the person who is truly a member of God's household. And remember these three words, called chosen, and faithful. So what does it mean to be called? To many it comes in the form of a trial or an inspiration that draws a person to the marvelous light of understanding found in the Word of God. That could be, as we say, an aha moment or a gradual awakening from the spiritual darkness and deceit that right now is smothering our entire world. When God the Father determines that a person's heart is prepared for his truth, then he calls him through his son, Jesus the Christ. How do we know that? Is that in the scriptures? Look at John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's a priceless honor to be called. But it isn't a guarantee of being chosen. Why is that? Well, look at 1 Corinthians, this is chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. It says this, For you see your calling, brothers, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. All right, that puts us in our place. Not many wise or strong, but it isn't mean to be a downer. It really, it it, it emphasizes that God looks on the heart of those called, who don't consider them to be better than others. He wants servants that he can elevate to positions of respect as they reveal humility and the desire to serve. You see, the true Christian will be the one who answers the call to seek the narrow and often difficult pathway through Jesus, and then to remain faithful to their calling. Now, we know how the church began, what God looks for in building the church, and how individuals are called and chosen. But the question remains, will everyone who consider themselves a Christian be saved Well, not according to Matthew 15, verses 7 to 9. Listen carefully. Not everyone that said to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven, not everyone that said to me, Lord, Lord, did you get that? Shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Only he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. The real test begins when God opens one's mind to his truth. Once the Creator begins to reveal truth to a person, then that individual bears a responsibility to act on it. 
If that person doesn't show a willingness to live by what he or she learns from this book, then God will add nothing more to his or her understanding. That person has shown that he really doesn't want to do even what he has already learned. Now the apostles taught that there were certain steps to be taken prior to becoming a true Christian. That's a part of the church built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. First is the step of repentance. The Apostle Paul made it clear that people's sins necessitated the death of the very Son of God. Look at how that news affected those who learned of their guilt. This is in Acts 2, verses 37 to 39. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off, and for all whom the Lord our God will call. So we see here several crucial steps to becoming a true Christian. First, a person must be called of God. Then he or she must repent of past sins. And after receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, then that new convert must prove that their salvation is true by good works and faithfulness to obey. Matthew 3.8 calls that producing fruit in keeping with repentance. Notice that Peter mentions baptism, a full study in itself and one that pastors may cover as they prepare to baptize those who request it. But briefly, Romans 6 describes water baptism as a, a physical act that represents our death, our burial, and our resurrection to new life through Jesus Christ. As we look at the church through the ages, we find that some, but not all, failed to live up to what was expected of them. In biblical typology, Revelations 2 and 3 reads like a grade card for seven specific churches, but it also reveals that the future churches planted until the very time of the rapture bear the same scrutiny. Now here's a brief summary of what each angel of each church was told to write about the character and the actions of the church they represented. First, the church in Ephesus. Although they did not tolerate wicked people and they endured hardships and they had not grown weary, they had a serious problem. They had forsaken the love they first had and many had fallen away. And they were warned to repent, to turn and change or they would lose paradise. Then was the church at Smyrna. God was apparently pleased with that church and encouraged them in their afflictions and poverty. They were being attacked constantly by the synagogue of Satan to the point of imprisonment and torture and even death. And they were told, be faithful, even to the point of death, and they would receive eternal life. But the angel was also told to add this, the one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Then there was a church at Pergamon. These were commended for remaining true to God even under the attacks of Satan. But there was this. Some among them still held to the teachings of Balaam and the Nicolaitans who enticed the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. And they were warned to repent and rid themselves of such blasphemers. Let God's wrath bring the sword of his mouth against them. Then the church at Thyatira. God's message to them was that he knew their deeds, their love, their faith, their service and perseverance, and that they are now doing more than they did at first. But then this, nevertheless, he had this against them. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. The church at Sardis heard this. They had a reputation of being alive, but they were dead. 
God found their deeds unfinished and they needed to wake up and repent. And yet there were a few in Sardis who were found unsoiled and worthy to walk with God and whose names would never be blotted out from the book of life. Then comes the church Philadelphia. Here the angel wrote this, I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength. You have kept my word and have not denied my name. And I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews, although they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. And since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. The final church was a church in Laodicea. This is called the lukewarm church because they were neither hot nor cold. They considered themselves rich and, and needing nothing. Their attitude was one of arrogance and in truth. They were, in God's sight, wretched, poor, pitiful, blind, and naked. A harsh rebuke. But they followed this hope at the end of that statement. Those whom I love, I rebuke and I discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Every modern church needs to look at what the angels were told to write and consider how it stacks up against their particular church and especially against the Philadelphia church. Jesus is coming soon. Don't doubt that. As we near the end, one dark prophecy looms, that of the great apostasy, the falling away of many so-called believers. So much of the blame for that falling away will fall on the shoulders of false pastors and teachers and the corrupted seminaries that teach another gospel. Even that is a sign. But as we close, let's look at the promises to be fulfilled for those who persevere. Jesus speaks to all of us in Revelation 3, verses 11 to 12. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God, and I will also write on them my new name. And now in closing, look at this fantastic promise to the church when the misrule of man finally comes to an end. This is Revelation 2, verses 26 through 29. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations, that one will rule them with an iron scepter and dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my Father. I will also give that the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Well, then the church disappears from the scriptures after the second coming. And yet, the work of salvation continues through the tribulation and into the millennium. But that's another story. Now, please don't miss any of these messages as the speakers and the staff of Through the Gathering Storm brings the truth of the living word to a dying world searching for answers. I'm Chaplain R.T. Byram, and I pray to the Lord Jesus Christ that you and yours will enjoy a blessed life in His care.